Right, so it's uh, time for a first session, and I'll just give you a little bit of background as to how we're going to run the sessions. Um, in this session, we've got, we're delighted, we've got uh, Emery and Deborah from Texas who've come over, and they are a fantastic uh, example of regenerative farming. And they will talk for 40 minutes. Right, just get that into your head. The next three that are talking will talk for 10 minutes each. So we're, you're not about to be faced with four 40 minute presentations. But the first one, and I'm sure it will just fly by, uh, will be so engaging that we felt it was necessary to let them show in picture form uh, exactly what they have achieved uh, through using regenerative farming. Um, it will also be facilitated by uh, Nick, Nick Barnard, who is here somewhere of Root Health, and thank you for breakfast, Nick. So he supplied the breakfast this morning. Um, and we'll let each of them speak, each of the speakers go, and then Nick will facilitate that session and eke out all the little bits where he, he thinks that perhaps there was disagreement or perhaps there was symmetry. And then we'll open it up to the floor with some uh, roving mics. So first, let me welcome Deborah and Emery uh, from Texas. Ready to roll? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Well, thank you. We, we are, let's see my hand, my body language. We are super excited to be here. I mean, we came from Texas and Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for letting this come, for opening the door for us, for letting us be part of this organization and this meeting. When we started looking at the speakers, some we knew and some we didn't know, but what we were completely aware of is that we are humbled and honored to be in the midst of folks that in the States are like Gabe Brown and Joel Salatin and Diana Rogers and Elaine Ingham, that we're in the midst of people of that capacity. And so that for us is a, is a very humbling but an honoring experience. So we just, again, thank you and want you to know how excited that we are to be here from Texas. This is my husband, Emery Birdwell. We do things differently. Uh, if you haven't seen our video yet that Peter Bick did about us, um, uh, we, we, we come at life very differently, we talk very differently, and so you'll see that dynamic as we move through this morning, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, we've already set the stage. I like to talk a lot, and Emery likes to talk very little. little okay, <laughs> and 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 I and I like to flourish in front of uh, of workshops and presentations. And Emery loves to be in the paddocks and in the pastures with the animals. So, if you'll bear with us, hopefully, you'll see that this dynamic as we move forward today. Today's focus: we want to talk about how the narrative in farming and ranching is changing. Now we use the term ranching a lot, and so if I use that, please know that I'm using encompassing farming and ranching. But that narrative is changing. When we first moved to the ranch, we were really focused on pounds of beef gained, right? We wanted to see how much weight we could put on those cattle. And then as time started to move on, we realized, well, we can't do that unless we focus on the forages, the grasses, and the forbs that are out there. And so what we started focusing on then was how are we making a difference in terms of grasslands? And then as we started understanding, wait a minute, we can't just focus on grasses and forbs. Where does all of this start? It starts with the soil. So that narrative is beginning to change from what we used to think of as benchmarks, from purebreds or genetics or yield. Whatever it was that you used in your farm or your ranch has changed over the course of time and in recent time. The second thing that we want to talk about is that we want to be bold. I was sharing with some of the friends that we knew, friends we met yesterday. We want to be bold and let you know and share with you that we believe 100% in this idea of holistic planned grazing. Whether you want to call it AMP, adaptive multi-paddock grazing, if you want to put the, the uh, terminology of mob grazing on it, if you want to call it rotational or planned rotational grazing or high density grazing, whatever you want to put on it, what we have come to know and experience is that anything planned in a holistic manner, that this is working. And it works at any scale. Yes, our, our ranch back home is a 14,000 acre ranch. 
and we run a great big herd. But it works at any scale. And so we want to be bold about that, to step out and say, whether you have 50 acres or 100 acres or 10,000 acres, whether you have a herd of 5,000 or you have a herd of 10, that this effort, when it's placed in a holistic context, produces benefits. We believe in it. There used to be a time when we would walk. Emory stayed hot, hidden since 1980 until 2000, in the 2000s. He stayed hidden in what he was doing. I used to walk into workshops and think I needed to put a paper sack over my head. We don't anymore. We don't have time to sit around and waste to think about whether this works or not. So be bold in your efforts. It works. And it works with any kind of livestock, whether it's cattle or sheep or goats or heck, chickens. You know, we're really focused in the States on multi-species grazing. And it works, again, it works. And the third, fourth thing that we want to talk about is that our decisions, the decisions we make regarding our grazing management will either negatively or positively impact the environment. That may sound like, well, really? So often people don't understand that the decisions that they're making negatively or beneficially impact our environments. So that's the today's focus. You want to add anything? No. Nope. <laughs> okay. And one of the things that we're going to share, this is a picture of one of the her the big herd at the ranch, and one of the things, some of the things that we want to share are the, just tell our story, and the conditions that we found on the ranch in 2004, those initial actions that we took, what we call phase one, is when we first moved to the ranch, the impact of the drought of 2010 to 2015, it was huge in the states. Five-year drought, and the impact of that drought, <laughs> good morning, <laughs> the impact of that drought on the decisions that we made and the, the decisions that we were forced to make, subsequent actions that we took, and we talk about that in terms of phase two, and last, the results and ongoing beneficial changes that we see in the ranch. So those are, those are the things we want to share with you. Now, yesterday, when we were coming to the site, our driver asked us where we were from, and part of it's obvious, Texas, or the states, or Texas, and, and I realized that I didn't put a picture of the United States, and because our driver wasn't quite sure where Texas was in relationship to the United States. So I hope you all know we are from Texas. Texas is in the southern part of the United States. We border with Mexico. And our ranch is located right here in north central Texas. We're almost in Oklahoma. Um, it's, it's in an area that is a transitional area between the Blackland Prairies and the Rolling Plains of Texas. And we'll talk a little bit more about that and you'll see the type of vegetation that we have. It's a more brittle environment than you have here, most definitely. This ranch was founded in the 1860s. By your standards, that's probably not very long ago. See, you're laughing, okay? But for us, that's a long time ago. And the important thing about it, this ranch was that it's only had three owners. Mr. Huggins, uh, besides the Native American Indians who inhabited the place to begin with. Besi Mr. Huggins put this property together in the late 1800s, and he was there until the 1920s, late 1920s. At that time, a gentleman named Brian Edwards came on board during the Depression, and he bought the ranch, and he kept the ranch Although he died, it stayed in his name and his family until 2004. That's when we bought this ranch. I had been in telecom and had my own career. Emory was the rancher, and I say with all due respect, that's all he knows. And that's, right. <laughs> that's, that's right. And I would say that with all he knows. That, that's what he knows. His uh, family is third generation farming and ranching in Texas. Again, by your standards, that's not, maybe not too long. But he went to uh, Texas Tech and got his degree, but he came back to the family ranch and then eventually branched out on his own. I was in telecom. And our, our telecom business did what it did during the 2000s with uh, public, uh, or tried to go public in the 2000s. And it was that roller coaster ride for tech and for telecom. And then and, uh, in 2000, it went bust. Um, and so we had been bought out. I didn't know what to do with my life. That was a family-owned business in telecom. I didn't know what to do. And I looked at Emory, 
who had raised our children. I was on the road with the crews, and I looked at Emery, who had raised our children and trained the horses and took them to all the rodeos, and I said, what, what are we going to do? And I thought, he said, well, we could, you know, maybe ranch together. And I thought, well, how hard can that be? <laughs> and I will share with you that that has been a journey that this has been the hardest career we have ever undertaken. And it's taken us a long time to learn to be partners in this endeavor. Okay? And I appreciate the fact that David and Wilma have talked about the struggles. This may be a bucolic industry, but it is certainly not one that is easy. And bucolic sometimes just disguises the hard work and the effort and the risks and the trials that go on behind that beautiful green rolling pasture out there. So long story short, we found this ranch. And on January the 30th, 2004, we closed on this ranch. I thought we were just going to live there kind of part time. We had a fully established home about 90 miles away. I thought we'd go there and do what, we, what ranchers do, and, but we'd live at home. And on the morning of January the 30th, Emery hooked up his pickup to his horse trailer, and he went upstairs and he got out all of his underwear and all of his socks and all of his blue jeans, and he packed the trailer with all of his saddlery and his tack and his horses and our dogs. And he, as he drove out the, the driveway, I'm standing there with our housekeeper that had been with us for more than a decade, and she looks at me and she says, I think you're moving. And I went, well, I think I'm moving too. Emery, this is how we didn't work together in those early days, right? He knew we were moving, and I thought we were just going for a visit every once in a while. So we ended up with this ranch, and, uh, and obviously I like to move around, and he likes to stand still, okay? So he's our anchor. Uh, we bought this ranch, and as Emery likes to say, that this was a real blessing to a guy like me who had spent his whole life sliding from rock to rock in the cedar and the skeets of, of North Texas and New Mexico. You want to describe this ranch? Yep. You run that thing. You're going to find what, out why what? she does most of the talking. Now, wait, what? Just, just, just describe. We're, we're not. Uh, okay, yeah. Here's what we found. Well, this is what this is what we found was this ranch was, it, like I said, been continuously grazed for since the early 1880s. Uh, this is an old Morbin stand of little blue stem. It's virtually worthless as it stood that day, uh, and it had no diversity involved in it. And in the end, I burned all this and a lot more to, to get it right. And uh, we didn't have the cattle to put it back on the ground. We didn't have the fencing up. We didn't have anything. I would never do that anymore. It's senseless to, to put that much forage up in the air as smoke when we could have put it back on the ground as litter and, and then eventually organic matter and carbon. So we went, but then we went on from that to the bare ground. And there was 25% of the ranch was bare. And this is hard to see in here, but this, this really doesn't depict it very well. Well, that's a, actually now I do see it. This is just one plant sitting in this, this bare spot. It had no filtration, no productive value to it. Uh, if water fell on it, it ran off. It might get the first half inch. This is even a worse situation. This is, uh, was part of the, like we're talking about 25% of the ground being bare. And we started about, you can see the edges out here, and we started in, out there building this back. But first we went in there and identified these areas, and we fenced these areas into as much as we could into one area. And we had all that doing that, so we, when we did graze it, we were grazing a common piece of ground. We would, uh, but when you're doing this, you're going out here at the edge out here, and you start on this edge, and you start building in this direction. Next. This is, we call them tanks, uh, or reservoirs, or ponds. This is what we had to water out of it in the beginning, and that's what I'd been watering out all my, my whole life. We went in and fenced these off as centers, and we built these paddocks in to center off this. It didn't take long to find out that wasn't going to work in that part of the country because our water that's, didn't hold up very well. So, uh, but this is what, where we were at when we began. Well, you, you like to say that water was the constraining force. Uh, yeah, this, this ranch had been for sale for several years, and later on I ran into a lot of these guys that had tried to buy it, and they, they said their biggest reason they didn't buy it was because of water quality was so poor. There was no well water on it. It just whatever rained in it and ran in a hole somewhere is the water we had. 
this is area, another area around that tank. And all the, the bare areas, a lot of it centered, or a lot, most of it centered around tanks because, as you said, this has been a continuous grazing situation since 1880s. And, of course, the cattle would come in here to water, and they'd, they'd graze out, and they'd graze back in. And they, all of their concentration was always here closer to these tanks. So your forage was worse here, and as you went back out away from it, it got better. But even then, it wasn't great. But these are the things we dealt with when we first got there. It was divided up into basically 12 pastures, and it's seven miles from one end of it to the other. Oklahoma's right above that top line right there. Uh, and in the summertime, in the, that's certainly our growing period, the prevailing winds are always out of the south, and when they run out of water, they'd start opening the gates. And most of your good water was down there on this end of the ranch, and the cattle started coming this way, and that prevailing wind kept stock go into the prevailing wind, or into constant wind, and they would come to the southern end of the ranch. We had the most water down here and the least amount of grass on this end of the ranch. The initial actions that we took, that's the what we found as a result of this ranch being in a continuous cow-calf operation since the late 1800s. And so what we had to do when we first started on that ranch, and again, it, when I use the we, I, that's the big we, because it was Emory. I was in telecom. I didn't know what we were looking at. at. I thought if it was green, they would eat it. Why would you want to spray it? I didn't, have an, I didn't have a clue about what the cattle really needed. So the big, this is a big we. Emory is the one that was principally responsible for these initial actions. So he's a stalker man. And I've asked several of you, what would that translate that word? So in Texas, in the States, we call it a stalker operation. And here, uh, stall, stall, stall cow. Stall cattle. Stall cattle. Uh, or yearlings. So they're yearlings. We take these cattle, uh, these calves, uh, just post weaning, they're being weaned, they come to the ranch, we send the, take them through a health protocol, and then they live at the ranch anywhere from four to nine months, depending on the date of the receipt. And we'll tell you more about what we do with those cattle, but we're a stalker operation, and that's what Emory is. He told me when we moved there that we could diversify and have some cow-calf, and I just thought, well, there again, there's that bucolic notion, right? We're going to have some stalkers, but we're also going to be a cow-calf operation. And I can tell you to this day, the only cow and calves that have been on that ranch are the neighbors. <laughs> He's not going to change. He is a stalker man. That's where his temperament is. That's what he does well, and that's where his expertise is. He also knew that with stalkers or yearlings or stall calves, stall cows, that we, they offered so much more flexibility that if we had a drought, we could destock in a lot, in a quicker way, and with a, without a lot of attachment that you have with your cows and your calves, right? right? He also knew that with that stalkers, that we could make the biggest impact on that ranch, especially in those degraded areas, quicker than we could within a cow-calf operation. Emory studied, studied under Alan Savory in the 1980s. And any of you know who Alan Savory is? So Alan Savory. So Emory studied with Savory in the 1980s in Albuquerque, New Mexico. He brought what he learned home to Texas. And he will tell you that he almost went broke twice trying to follow the, the, the headlines of what Savory preached, not the practices and principles that support that headline. Oh, we're already 20 minutes into this sucker? OK, we got to speed this up. OK, we are way, OK, I'm going to talk fast now. We're quit talking. So anyway, we're a stalker operation. OK, this is uh, with some of those initial actions that we took place. We added water. You knew it was a major constraint. We, so we started adding stock tanks or ponds. We put in more than 150 miles of electric fence. We took those 12 large pastures and divided them into 140 paddocks centered around the waters that were there. And those paddocks range in size of 45 to 125 acres. Then we were running at that time, let me back up just, we were running three herds, three herds of 1,500 apiece. And this click, I can't get this clicker to work, but we had a south side, a south cell, a north cell, and a, a west cell. And in each one of those cells, we were running about 1,500 head, rotating them, not as aggressively as we do now, but uh, we were moving them, and we started to see changes. And then, 
then 2010 and 2015. This is the second in the top three worst droughts in Texas in history. Uh, and it was also the thing that turned, changed our life and made it a whole, our, our operation a lot better. So some of the actions we took, it's yours, it's yours. We, we had 5,300 cattle at the time. We figured out that it was never going to rain again, and it virtually had not rained since the day we bought the first one. We sold one in there. We had two-thirds two of the herd contracted to sell. We had not sold one, that third herd for that reason. Uh, we sold that one, one herd off, combined the two herds, and, and started running the 30, around 3,500 cattle at that time in one, in one herd through the whole ranch. And that's important. We started seeing the whole ranch as one sale in a holistic fashion rather than the three individual sales. We started, that first year we started out laying polypipe and just trying, we, we had water in some tanks that other parts of the ranch didn't have any. We started laying polypipe on top of the ground and started setting water troughs as fast as we could. We were virtually doing it in front of the cattle coming. The day we set this trough right here, this was later on, this was almost seven miles from the other end of the ranch. There was a fire coming from one direction. The, the cattle were coming from the other. And as we were sat in that trough, my neighbor called and asked me, can you get my, my sister out of her house? We left that day. Ended up, she didn't burn up, and we lived again, too. I, we, Emory has these moments that he comes in, and this was a significant change during the trout. We, we were losing water. There were areas of the ranch that were overgrazed. There were areas of the, water, uh, the ranch that were undergrazed. The main constriction, again, that we keep repeating was that, that we didn't have water in those area, in all areas of the ranch. It was not accessible. He has these times where he comes in, and in, Texas, in the States we call it Michelob Ultra. That's what he likes to drink. So he comes in at night and he thinks about what we've done that day and what we're faced with. And so I call them his Michelob Ultra epiphanies. <laughs> And so he had a, and I think that Michelob ought to pay us and they need to give us decals because he came up with this notion of the mobile water trough. And Emory, you want to explain what the mobile water trough is? We were setting those big rubber tires out there and they're, it cost $1,500, $2,000 a piece to put them in. We were putting them, started out putting them in the centers and that wasn't working. And I realized we need to be putting them in the paddocks. Well, there's 150 paddocks and we put, if we split each a wire, each two packs with one trough. You can do the math, it's 75 times 1,500, 2,000. So one night I figured, decided we'd take, this was the first mobile water trough we, we made. And this is what we drug around to each, we put a valve in each paddock on the fence line and we would flop that back and forth and water the cattle out of this. That's an old propane tank that he, that he cut in two with a friend of his and made it into this mobile water trough. That first one was too big and what we found out, it's not about how many cattle you can water. As long as you've got water in there for the ones that can get in, get to it, you're all right. It's when the other end of that trough runs out of water, you got a problem. So we, this is a 16-foot trough. It waters all of those cattle you can see out there, and that's all the water they had. Some of the other uh, constraints or challenges that we found was once when we put this big herd together was how do you move them? And all of our operation is based on low stress for the cattle. So we don't want to go where the cattle are and then drive them to a 15-foot gate. We want to go where they are and be able to move them so that we minimize the stress on them. So we stole this idea off of YouTube. And it's just a matter, I don't know how you would do this with your stone fences here. I, I, I don't know how much of a sacred cow the stone fences are. But we, we have that single strand of, of electric wire. We'll go to where the cattle are. We put this PVC pipe on it, and, um, and the cattle will start to move under. And again, you might see it better on the, the, the TV screens back here. But here's uh, the, the cattle just learn to gently, on their own, at their own speed, move under the, the electric wire. wondering how many people we have working at the ranch during this period of time there were three 
Emery, me, and one hand named Omar Corrales. Notice we don't drive anything anywhere. Everything follows us one way or the other. So just an example again, we, we kind of don't like that term mob because it sort of implies a really unruly type of atmosphere. The cattle are calm and gentle and, and they know the, the, the scheme. They know what we're about to do. When it, we also took those 45 to 125 acre paddocks and we will subdivide them with polywire. And make it, so that way we are taking the cattle to grasses that they are forbs that they might not have wanted to eat. So we further subdivide. And yes, you can put 5,000 head of cattle in a two or three acre uh, area. Where of course they're not going to stay very long at all. But again, we're we're pu pushing them into areas where we we're not pushing them. We are letting them go into areas that we define. One of the other obstacles we had to learn, I'm not going to waste a lot of time on this, we do feed a protein supplement, a 19% uh, corn gluten uh, supplement to our cattle just to provide them with more uh, protein. And in the end, we had to figure out how do you, again, in a low stress way, get that, that cake out on the ground for them. And we ended up building these three feed trailers. It looks like something straight out of Mad Max and the Road Warrior. So uh, this, is, this is an example. You can't see it here. But as a matter of perspective, the, uh, just the herd size and the uh, feed wagon going in there to try to get them fed. And again, a very gentle routine manner. That was during a dry time too. That was, yeah. We don't feed ever all the time. So primarily out of this condition that we found, out of these initial actions that we took, there were two primary holistic management practices at work out of the framework of two principles and six practices out of the HMI holistic framework. This is the thing. It, it took, I've been doing this for 30 something years and I, find, I always talked about herd impact. It wasn't until we went to this big herd that I realized how important animal and herd impact was. This was in 2011, the fall or spring, and we just put these cattle together and normally it's not like this, but it, it was, they were hunting me and I was hunting them and they needed something to eat. And so this is where we ended up. But the, what you gain for the herd impact is is the, the hoof action on the ground. It grinds up the manure and urine. It takes down this old morbid grass, if, if there is any. It, it helps with water filtration. It feeds, and it, by doing so, you're feeding the underground, the microbes, the earthworms, uh, and the dung beetles are what helps taking this out. But when you take these one big herd of cattle like this, and that many dung beetles, and you're feeding one area, there's a there's a difference in what you're doing to the ground because that one con that's all concentrated, and it's a tremendous impact or effect that comes from it. This is just an example of where we've been in. We didn't take all the grass off. You can see this grass; it was not even grazed at all. But this is trampled. It's mixed, messed up here and this grass will spring back up that wasn't eaten, and you still have the, the able to uh, take a bit, uh, benefit of the photosynthesis, and when a drop of water hits that thing, it's not running off, it's going in the ground. This is an example where these cattle, you, we move that fence line every time from where it was the last time, just because you have the greatest impact against that wire, and they, they know these cattle have already moved over here. But you move that wire over, and you move that line, and uh, the, these cattle have a, uh, oh, now I'm going to blink, but competitive attitude about them. If, when They may not be hungry, they may be laying down, but if you roll that wire up and one of them crosses it, every one of them thinks he's got to go because he's, he's afraid somebody's going to get something if, if, that he's not. You have to put that wire up. If it's a long paddock, they will go automatically go to the back end of that paddock. You've got to stop them and get them to graze and go on to the next section. Uh, Just a, again an example of what we, where we've come and where we're going. You know, we're not taking it down to the bare ground. We're leaving something there. This is a plant right here that was, it's grazed, grazed off halfway. The cattle are gone. This, and you want to leave it, this is actually more than half. If you actually want to get into half, half is down here. But the, they'll take that top third off. That's where your highest energy is. And they'll come in and get that part first. And again, important to know that this is an area where 5,000 head of cattle just went and moved through. Okay? The impact that, that that's there. This is wintertime. And 
this is the time when we slow cattle down, we keep them here. They've just gone into this paddock right here, and this is where they end up when they're leaving. We're trying to get all of it back on the ground. This is littered down here on the ground. This holds the water, keeps the ground cooler in the wintertime, and it's there to just act as a sponge. This is what it was. This is where we ended up. This is the second most important, or there's two, it's not, they're not rated one over the other. There's two most important parts of this is herd impact and recovery. And you've got to have, it depends on the area here, y'all would be probably more in this area right here or less. We're in this one four to five. It, this, we use a short, graze, short grazing period during the middle of the year when it's good. When it gets, it gets drier, it's grass is growing slower, we go to a longer uh, rest period. So you know what we're talking about here? We're moving them, and so the, any paddock in our fast-growing season is rested for at least 45 days or more. In the slow-growing season, that paddock is rested for 145. We slow down the movement of the cattle, and it's rested for 145 days. And the reason is, is that we're trying to establish and keep those, those roots in the ground and keep those plants as healthy as possible for a long period of time. We've been on that ranch 15 years. We average grazing two and a half days during the growing season. This is not counting the uh, non-growing season. But during the growing season, we're grazing two and a half days out of the year. There's 30, in that 15 years, we've grazed 37 total days out of 15 years during the growing season. And I had this figured out how many, so I could tell you the days and I lost my nose. But you can, but we figure 180 day grazing season and so, we're, we're this thing, we think this is tells a big story right here. So out of the 15 years we've been there, any given paddock during the fast growing season has only been grazed 37 days. So why do we, why do we graze this? Why do we manage in this way? Well, we're doing so because of the impact that we want to have on soil health. And we're doing it through the four ecosystem processes, the mineral, energy, water, and that community dynamics. And those dovetail with the five fundamentals of, of a good soil health. So these are the reasons why we're grazing this way. So that we, not just because we like to see one big herd move around like the bison or, or big herds in Africa, but because we're after an impact and we're after an outcome. When one of the telltale signs about the changes that have been made at the ranch, this is a satellite imagery taken in 2014 and 2016. 2014 was the fourth year of the drought. And you can see, I don't know how wet you can see here, but can you see all of these areas? This is the bare ground, and that's the comparison. Bare ground. And what we came out of the drought in 2016, and do you see a difference in the two pictures? So again, this type of grazing works. Out of a five-year drought, we come out with more grass than we had in the middle of the drought, understandably, but the fact that we were coming out of the drought, okay? I might add that during that, after we decreased our herd that first year in 11, we went back to 5,300 and we maintained that herd size through the next four years of the drought. And we got, we became more aggressive in our moves. So today we'll move anywhere from four to six, four to eight times a day. That big herd moves that many times a day. And so these are shots that are, this is the, the, in the area where that bare ground is. This is looking across. It used to be two and a half miles of red bare clay. And now this may not be real sexy grasses in Forbes, but at least it's something. It's something that's covering up the bare ground. This picture here as well. It's that early succession Forbes and grasses that are coming on that are beginning to provide that protective armor for the, because what? Bare ground is enemy number one, right? Bare ground is enemy number one. Again, these pictures are illustrative of how the, those four ecosystem processes are working. This is an example of photosynthesis. We are now in that bare ground capturing all of the energy that we can get. Different leaf sizes, different heights of the, the plants and the grasses, but we're wanting to maximize so that we capture all the energy that we can. Again, they're showing the diversity in, in the paddocks that's coming on. Not that old moribund little blue stem slide that we showed you to begin with, that that was the only thing in the pasture, but what's coming on now in terms of community dynamics and the biodiversity. Same thing in the fall. You can't see it but because it's washed out, but our fall forage is, is, is very diverse. It's coming on. This, was, this, is, this for us was a crowning moment. It was like having a new grandchild. 
We found this, it's called Eastern Gamma Grass, and it was virtually extinct in our part of the world. She's called the queen of the prairie grasses in the United States, highest level of protein. She made a comeback in the ranch in 2013, and now we're beginning to see her go all across the riparian areas in the ranch. She is our crowning glory. I get my hair stands up on my arms if you knew about what this means for us. Emory, you want to talk about this? This is a spot I took just before we left. This is, and if you, if you can see it better, I guess we can back up, maybe you can see it better. This is not so much about the grass, it's about the weeds and forbs and legumes that's in that area. And I, I don't remember how many I counted in there. Those yellow flower looking things out there are called prairie parsley. Nobody in our country knows what it is, but except cattle, and they love it. They'll graze it when it first comes up, and then when it gets a chance to grow, they'll eat those yellow heads. But there's about probably 10 to 12 different forbs and legumes in there. Our neighbors that spray, will, this would all be dead or will die. But we don't spray bluntly because this is, this, these grasses and forbs, protein and energy are higher than our grasses that we're striving to grow. So we're really proud of this spot right here. Nobody else would be. We got five, mile, five minutes. This okay. is the edge of a water where we, where these, this tank was, was in the picture before was bare ground out to here. We fenced it off and now we use these water troughs. We're holding these cattle out and this grass is growing up and we're filtering that water going. This was a red, what we call red water tank. It's not anymore and we filtered it from, with this grass. This is another deal, erosion. This is the end of the erosion. We've still got to fix this. These, this was all bare ground. Now you see this grass is growing up to the edge of this little stream. Which, and what you do with a big herd like that, you can't tell so much, maybe you can on that one, but the, you get those herd, the number of cattle in there, and you start rolling these edges off. You break those sharp edges off, and when it starts leveling off, you're able to grow grass on that. This is after rain, but this is coming out on those red water tanks. This is clear water. I mean, this, and this used to not be this way. And of course, it's even going to be more clear because this grass is that away for, from now to the Red River, and it's going to keep filtering it. And we, we don't want one drop of our water to go down to Dallas Fort Worth. We don't want one drop of it, okay? We're selfish. But if it does, it's going to be clean. Right? Now that's if, if it does, and we're going to be contributing to their water sources, it's going to be clean. So an example of the water cycle at work. This is sedge, and most people in our country, don't, I didn't know it until I got to watching. But this normally comes in a seepy area, and I knew that, but I didn't know how much cattle liked it. Now we're starting to find this grass up on the sides of the hills or on top of the hills where there's not any seepage, but there's enough water underground now that we're holding, starting to hold in there that we're able to grow this grass. And then we have the example of the mineral cycle. And we can go on and talk about that. You'll have other people that are going to talk about good soil health. What's going on underneath there with the fungi and the bacteria and the ratios and the organic matter? We are late to the stage in terms of our monitoring because there were only three of us working for a long, long time. So we didn't even think about going out there to monitor. We were trying to make a living and keep cattle healthy and build good soils. We do now have some studies that are in progress. Peter Donovan with the Soil Carbon Coalition, another project called Soil for Water. If you want to talk about that, we can do so. But just to show you again, that we're, if you could really see this pick, this dung pat, you see the dung beetles, the, the, the holes, their homes that they're making as they go through and, and, and carry that dung under the soil. And again, just an example, I can smell that. I don't know about you guys, but I can smell that soil and it smells good. And I might not be able to tell you the statistics, but what we know again is that this type of planned grazing works. Over the course of time, what we show is, is that when you're, when you're improving your, stock, your grasslands, then you can improve your carrying capacity, right? And your, if you're doing planned grazing, then that carrying capacity improves the grasslands. And over the course of time, you start to spread your costs over a, 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 that number, and so your fixed costs decrease. Make sense? So in terms of that second leg of that three-legged stool, when we talk about the triple bottom line, we've talked about the environmental side of the house. This is the economic side. We're not going to spend a lot, but it gives you a opportunity for profit, that profit that we're all seeking. It gives you the opportunity for profit. And again, this type of grazing, there are reduced inputs, a reduced labor force. We don't need a whole herd of cowboys to do what we're doing. So now today, though, we're thankful we have four people, Emory, myself, and two other hands. And that's the reason we get to be here today. Uh, no herbicides, 
no seeding, we haven't fed hay, we don't feed hay to our outside cattle. So all of those kinds of um, uh, initiatives result in less inputs, less expense to the bottom line. I would be remiss as a certified educator for holistic management not to share our holistic goal with you. And I'm gonna read it really fast if I can find a place to read it. And because this is what holds you together. Now I don't know what spiritual connection or faith or whatever you have, but in times of trouble, when things get really harsh in holistic management, we have that holistic goal that can pull us together and remind us of why we're doing what we're doing. We came through an Armageddon year about three years ago. We got what, some people have heard presentations where I talk about that. This is what held us together. It's tacked to the wall behind my computer screen. We have accomplished our goals and continue to be active and hardworking. The ranch is a place where our family, friends, and community come to joyfully participate in ranch activities and explore the benefits of holistic management. Healthy ecosystems thrive, resulting in productive soils, forage, water, livestock, and wildlife. Our community and our world see the ranch as a model of improving, achievable, and profitable management that is available for future generations. That's the glue that holds us together. We bring people out to the ranch. Our kids and our grandkids are there. This is our form of mutton busting. I don't know that you do that to your sheep and lambs here, but that's another story. Um, and our, our grandchildren are coming out to see us, and we get to enjoy the lifestyle that we want to have with our English pointers and our birds and, and do the things that make our life meaningful. So we just want to tell you, I'm sorry we went over. Uh, we, I hope it comes across that we love what we do, right? Right. right. <laughs> and, thank you. Thank you so much, that was just fab. Right, our next speaker is Professor Christine Watson of SRUC. Now, I've been going to talks that Christine has do been doing for, well, we've been organic for 20 years, um, and so it's probably more than 20 years that you've been studying soils. And all of a sudden, it's sexy. So you, you must be so much in demand, Christine, so we're delighted you can spend some time with us today. Thanks, thanks very much, and, and, and thank you, Deborah and Emery, for a, a brilliant introduction to what I'm going to say. And thank you, Wilma, for the longest title ever that I've ever been given. Um, it's a very long and complex title, which we're about to see. Um, and uh, it is an introduction to a, a long and complex subject. No, I haven't got it yet. There we go. Soil carbon, latest evidence and thinking on the relationship between grazing livestock, soil organic matter, and soil carbon sequestration. Really snappy, eh? <laughs> complex title, complex topic. I thought I'd just start off by thinking about actually what, what is carbon sequestration? Because it's something that gets used a lot and doesn't always get used correctly. So if you look up the dictionary de definition of sequestration, it's about holding on to. And we can increase the amount of soil carbon or soil organic matter in soils without actually sequestering carbon. So if we put manure into soil, we're just moving carbon from one place to another. We're not putting something additional in there. 
So David Paulson of Rothamsted defines it as an additional transfer of carbon from the atmosphere and a genuine contribution to climate change mitigation. I don't know how well you can, you can see the pictures, but if you don't look after your soil carbon, that picture down at the bottom is taken somewhere south of the Lerth Plateau in China and is the wall of a glass house built from eroded soil. Don't want to do that. So just some thoughts, some facts. Soil carbon sequestration is finite. There is a limit to the amount of carbon we can get into soils because there is a limit to what we can actually hold within the soil matrix. It's actually quite easy to reverse it by doing the wrong thing. Um, so it's not, it's not a process that's there forever. And even if we can increase soil organic carbon, that sometimes is associated with greenhouse gas losses. So this, is, this talk is going to be all about balance. And it's going to be all about the idea that we need to think about the balance of what's going into the system, what's coming out of the system, but also the idea that soils are very diverse, and what works in one soil doesn't always work in another. Um, and we're thinking about this today in terms of soil carbon and grazing management from a UK perspective um, and looking at some of the evidence that we have for the kind of soils that we have. So we just think a little bit about soil organic matter. What, what makes up soil organic matter? Well, the bugs and beasties, the soil life is about 10% of, of, uh, of, of the organic matter in soils. We've then got around another 10%, which is the kind of fresh residues, which can, can turn over in somewhere from sort of minutes to about half a century. We've then got what we call humus, which uh, tends to turn over in, in numbers of kind of tens of years or hundreds of years. And then we've got the resistant organic matter, about 15%. And that's the stuff that we want, the stuff that stays there for thousands of years. So we're thinking about how we feed that organic matter into soil. I'm going to explain this diagram a bit more in, in a few minutes. But what I want you to look at is that top box, this box up here, because that's about the things that help us to control the amount of organic matter and carbon going into soil. So the inputs, the fertilizers, the manures, the choices that we make about management, and we've just heard a fantastic talk about that, about how we graze, when we graze, um, what the breed of cattle might be, what the sward composition is, uh, what happens in terms of reseeding or topping. So those are all the things that day-to-day -day decisions being made on the farm that can influence soil carbon. So what are the effects of management? Uh, Wilmer asked me to summarize the evidence, so that's what I've tried to do. Um, and one of the best sources of evidence that we've got that's UK-wide is the countryside survey data. Um, and what that shows is that as the management intensity increases, so carbon stocks in the soil tend to reduce both at the surface and at the depth, at depth. And what I mean by management intensity is that the, the higher the stocking rate, the more the fertilizer, the more the lime that goes into it, then that is associated across the country with a, reduce in, a reduction in soil carbon. In scientific terms, something called meta-analyses have become very trendy, um, which is a way of bringing together the evidence published by different workers under different conditions and analyzing the data and looking at what statistically changes things. So a recent uh, analysis that was published in, uh, in 2018 shows that actually overall grazing can reduce soil carbon by 15%, but of course that all depends on management. What does lime do? What does increasing the pH do? Well, overall, there was no significant effect shown by this meta-analysis, but there's a trend for an increase in soil carbon associated with some lime. Fertilizer, a significant increase in soil carbon, but it is all about balance. If you put too much fertilizer on, then you can have the opposite effect, and I'll come back to that. So too much lime or fertilizer, you can stimulate a lot of microbial activity in the soil. You can cause the, the, the bugs and the, the soil animals to respire more. You lose carbon dioxide. You put on too much nitrogen fertilizer. You reduce the carbon to nitrogen ratio of your plant material, so the plant material becomes more easily degradable. So it is all about that balance in terms of what you 
put into the system and what comes out. And also, I mean, too much lime or fertiliser can also reduce sward diversity, which is, is a very important component here. So what is it that grazing does that actually influences soil carbon? And I've tried to take this apart. Of course, it's really important to think about the whole system, but just, I've just taken this diagram apart to help us to think about the different things that happen. So animals eat vegetation, they respire, they breathe methane out, and around 25 to 40% of the carbon that they eat comes back, which is where the idea that grazing reduces carbon comes from. If it's overgrazed, then you, reduce, you, you can remove the, the plant merry stem and reduce the production because you're, you're effect, effectively preventing photosynthesis. So again, it's about controlling the system so that you graze in just enough. If you remove the, the vegetation, uh, you expose the soil, you become, su become subject to, to runoff and soil particles carry away carbon and the water can carry away soluble carbon. And similarly, sort of poaching the system or compaction, you get, a run you get runoff, you get that reduction in photosynthesis. So you can see here, you can build up a picture and think about what all the different things that are doing, due to soil, going on go due to soil carbon. Now, removing the vegetation, if you remove vegetation above ground, plant roots respond to that and you get, a, you get root death. But as you change the system uh, and remove carbon, you can also change the soil microbial communities. So we want to have more and more active soil communities, but we need this balance between what the plant root system is doing and creating habitats for those soil microbial communities to live in. One place where there's a really nice piece of evidence, this is from uh, an ecologist um, in, in the States, uh, David Tillman, um, showing very nicely that uh, as you increase the number of species, so the soil carbon storage per year goes up, and that's just in two time periods, uh, the, the first 13 years and the second 13 years. So nice, clear piece of evidence there. Now, we've just heard a lot about mob grazing. Um, does it increase soil carbon? Does it reduce soil carbon. Nice piece of work going on in field labs, wherever CLEM is, the Soil Association Field Labs. But really, from a UK perspective, we do not have the evidence. And I'm not saying that uh, mob grazing does increase soil carbon, or that it doesn't, but simply that we don't have the scientific evidence, and it's crying out for a really nice piece of science. Um, so the jury is still out on that one. But whatever happens, soil texture is important, pH is important and the climate is important. Very quickly, where is our soil carbon? Again, the countryside survey data. Look how much soil carbon we've got in Scotland. We've only got a small proportion of the uh, UK population. We've got a lot of the carbon, though. Let's keep it that way. And you can see that it, it, it relates to the, 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 where the, the grassland farms are. There is no infinite capacity of soils to, uh, to increase soil carbon. And you can see here, again, data from Rothamsted showing that you might increase soil carbon over up to about 100 years, and then it plateaus because you've reached that point where the soil can hold no more carbon. And I am coming to the end with some thoughts to, to take away. So really, we've got a key issue here about a balance between inputs and outputs. But we have to be realistic about what we can do finite capacity to, to, to sequester carbon, and we need to be really clear when we're thinking about this. Are we talking about managing soil organic matter, or are we talking about sequestering carbon? But simply putting, soil, putting organic matter into soils is good. There is no doubt about it. it's good. It's good for plant production, it's good for biodiversity, it's good for soil structure, it's good for water holding capacity, it's good for drainage. Increase the soil carbon. So there isn't a single solution to all this. There are lots. The scientific evidence is starting to come through, but we lack the scientific evidence in a holistic sense for actually how we look at the whole system. Um, and of course, there is a balance between what might be the biophysical potential for uh, sequestering soil carbon and what might be the economic potential or even the possible social potential for increasing soil carbon. That's it for now. Good. Thanks very much, Christine.
Right, our next speaker is Rob Richmond, who's an organic dairy farmer in the Cotswolds. And really what I'm hoping to hear from Rob is how is this all going to work in the UK and how does this work in a dairy environment? So over to Rob. Good morning. I was asked to come here and speak about the regenerative agriculture practices we've put in place on farm and the results we've got from it. Nothing I've been done over the last 15 years has had anything to do with being regenerative. My sole aim has been to run a productive organic dairy farm on a difficult farm at 800 feet on top of the Cotswolds. So I moved to Manor Farm in 2004 to manage it. It's an 850 acre estate, at 800 feet, top of the Cotswolds, and we actually farm about 500 acres. The rest of the farm is um, woodland and tracks. So in 2004, when I got there, there was 110 cows, predominantly autumn calving, 50 young stalk, about 150 acres um, fenced and watered that we could graze. The other 360 acres was an arable rotation, winter wheat, spring barley, and Westerwolds ryegrass for silage. So 110 cows and 50 young stalk basically had 260 acres of grassland and they were using 200 kilos of nitrogen a hectare. Now, I was told when I got there that Manor Farm was an inhospitable place in the winter and the first place in the county to drought out in the summer. But I was determined we were going to run a grass-based dairy. And at that time, I heard about Cotswold grass seeds, deep root in lays, thought they would have potential. Spoke to Ian Wilkinson, he says, quite expensive though, so I'd advise you just go with the cheapest one and see what happens. So we put 30 acres in back in 2005. It struggled to establish that winter, but 2006 was a dry summer. That herbal lay, we grazed every three weeks from mid-July through to mid-September. Um, and the ryegrass next door to it, we grazed in July and again late September. So by then, I knew where we were going. September 2007, we converted to organic. Everything that we've reseeded since then has been herbal lays. The mixtures have become more and more complex till today. We're sowing nine species of grass, five herbs, and four or five legumes. Um, so along the way, 2007, we went to organic. Uh, 2012, we switched from spring calving to autumn calving, from autumn to spring calving even. And then 2016, we moved into a new parlour in the middle of the farm, no more housing, no more slurry, um, and removed so, uh, soluble nutrients altogether. So we've had to learn to farm, move away from MPK-led agriculture, learned a farm with the background reading I'd done on um, the herbal lays, realized that the focus had to be on soil organic matter and on soil biology. So the first thing we had to do, for all we're on shallow soils over limestone, we've got a high clay content. The arable land had always been shallow plowed and power harrowed. There was plow pans right across the farm, so it stood wet in winter, droughted out in the summer. We used a min-till tool um, with discs and subsoil legs. The subsoil legs were only set about eight to 10 inches deep, but that was enough to pull these plow pans out. The discs meant we kept all the organic matter mixed in the top three to four inches of soils, allowing us to rebuild and regenerate that soil rapidly. And we learned to feed the soil by using compost, a great way of re-inoculating soil, putting stuff putting the bugs back in the soil with a food source and a house, but also to stimulate the soils using things like molasses and um, milk. Spraying these on, we can boost the system in the spring, keep it going through the summer. And ultimately, grazing management was key to this. Now, we'd always run the cows on a rotational system, grazing short grass, sort of New Zealand style, until I went to Acres Conference in 2009. 
saw mob grazing, saw those types of things they were doing. From 2010 onwards, our young stock have been run on block grazing, on daily moves. We've seen huge benefits from pasture growth and young stock uh, performance from that. The cows have been on twice daily moves after milkings, and we've been on a steep learning curve as to where is best to graze these, um, these swords to keep as much green leaf area on the farm as possible throughout the year, photosynthesizing, also to get the production out of the cows and the production out of the pasture. And I think a key to it all is our calves are out at pasture from two weeks old, and they're reared on a grazing system, on a rotation, and um, actually come into the herd, it's, it's natural to them. And the key to it is managing the rotation length. This time of year, we'll be running a rotation about 22, 25 days. Later in the season, we're on an 80 to 100 day rotation. And then, um, so where we are today, 12 years since organic conversion, we're running 300 cows and 200 young stock on 500 acres. We're outwintering all stock using a combination of deferred grazing, brassicas, and some silage. And then we're carving on a straw pad from sort of mid to late February onwards with cows straight back onto pasture 24 hours a day after that. So the results we've obtained along the way, carbon sequestration or building organic matter, I might be corrected on this yet. Um, we, have, we set off with 2 to 4% organic matter in the top 3 to 4 inches of soil. We now have 8, 10, and in some places, 12 inches of dark soil. The top 6 inches is running at 8 to 10% organic matter. Um, equating that, it's roughly 25 tonnes of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. We've increased pasture production massively compared to where we were with ryegrass and nitrogen. And the key thing is we've increased the, uh, the quality of that pasture. We're actually getting less sugars and less uh, non-protein nitrogen in the forage, higher oil content and higher protein content. That is feeding far better. The stock are healthier. We've been on an antibiotic-free contract now for four years. Um, improved water management. We've seen benefits in soil structure. Crumb structure is better. The pastures absorb water when it rains. They hold on better in dry weather. Last year, we were still on a 25-day round up to late um, July. As we went into August, our pastures were still green and responded rapidly to the moisture as it came. We've improved the soil mineral balance, the key balance is calcium magnesium. We're on limestone with very high calcium. On the pastures that have been um, down for 10 to 12 years, we're getting those balances uh, much more even, and much more wildlife. I described that farm in 2004 as a wildlife desert. We now have a huge amount of um, insects, both the pinups, the pollinators, but we've got a huge amount of ground insects, spiders, beetles, dung beetles. And as a result of that, we've got a huge amount of bird life, birds nesting through the summer, and flocks of small birds feeding across the pastures right through the winter. So for all, what I've done has been production orientated, um, aimed to run a productive organic system. We've ticked a lot of the environmental, sustainable and holistic boxes along the way. Thank you. Need no introduction, obviously. <laughs> uh, Denise uh, from Peelham Farm has been one of the collaborators in this conference, and she's got a great story to tell with regard to biodiversity practices. Thanks, Fiona. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, the presentation, the case study of biodiversity on our farm, is in the context of the recent United Nations report on the state of global biodiversity and I'm sure you're all aware of that, the extinction of species and ecosystem collapse. In 2015, the reckoning was that 25,000 species were in danger of extinction. Now, 
the United Nations are saying it's a million species. So we are at a very, very crucial position in terms of global biodiversity. So just in terms of location, east meets west. So the North Sea to the Irish Sea across a fantastic range of biodiversity in the Scottish context. 250 acres of mixed farming, diverse topography, diverse soils, diverse productivity. Um, we run cattle, sheep, and pigs. We're an integrated family farm, organic and pasture for life certified. It's been a long journey, 29 years. Uh, Chris and I started with a 10 hectare small holding in 1990, um, invited by our, our neighbor. We, within five or so years, increased to 250 acres. We became organic in 2005 and pasture for life more recently. Habitat restoration commenced in earnest in about 1998 and continues to the present. It's too slow, but nonetheless. I really want to focus on how we actually make good biodiversity loss. It's not about counts of different species. It's all about structure. Conservation biologists now are saying the key to reversing biodiversity loss is actually addressing habitat fragmentation and um, the isolation of species in small increasingly vulnerable habitats. So we're looking at structural diversity, dynamic function between habitats, nodal connections, which are the connections between different habitats where they meet, edge length, so where you've got continuous habitat, the edges that can reflect light, that reflect different conditions, that provide the conditions for butterflies and birds and plants, and us as well and also corridors along which we can have both species and gene flow. If habitats are fragmented, there's no flow. We actually get a static environment, and it's static for us too. So it's addressing isolation. It's actually patching up to create continuous diverse habitat matrix. So restoring biodiversity depends absolutely entirely on restoring habitat structure. When we first came to Pelham, with, I don't know if that, can you see that? We had basically very, very limited connectivity. Only eight nodal connections, the meeting between two different continuous habitats. no connectivity either side of a very vulnerable hotspot, biodiversity hotspot. Very quickly, what Chris and I and our business partner Amanda did is at that stage, we weren't organic. We actually avoided any fertilizer runoff to our hotspot. So very, very early on, that was something that we protected. And edge density, only 31 meters a hectare. 2019, you can see immediately the difference. We've got something like a 20% increase in the hotspot area, and I've identified that in terms of identifying key indicator species, which tell me that the hotspot has increased. We've increased woodland by 50%, hedgerows by 75% in length, standing water with seven we had one pond, we've now got seven ponds, there's been literally a seven-fold increase in the area of standing water. We've now got 38 nodal connections and edge density of 60, 65 metres a hectare. So suddenly, structurally, it's actually making an impact. We've also now implementing short-term management in terms of wild bird seed area of about three hectares and grassland management bird rotation. Sorry, beg your pardon in this area, about five hectares every year over a 60 hectare um, area. So we've got key habitat indicator species. We never did a baseline survey when we first moved to Pelham. We were very busy farming um, and establishing our business. But what we do know is that we've got 
mixed farmland indicators, and these are all red and amber um, listed species. We've got tree sparrow, linnet, skylark, yellowhammer, grey partridge, white throat, and other warblers. And tree sparrow are, are particularly threatened, and they are now coming into the farm. Uh, we've got wetland plant specialists with four regionally rare plants, black bog rush, marsh orchid, moonwork, grass, grass of Parnassus. Um, the national and seriously, seriously threatened corn bunting. We had breeding on the farm boundary, but it hasn't been recorded, sadly, for about five years. So the RSPB call it functionally extinct because there's no, um, there's no evidence of it breeding. But we still, it has a very wide uh, distribution area, so we're still hoping that uh, we might see it yet. Um, very significantly, very recently, the pearl bordered fritillary was recorded on the farm for the first time in 150 years in Berwickshire. That hasn't been seen for a few years, but its breeding and feeding plants, the, um, the marsh violet and bugle and marsh thistle, are still there in abundance. So we only hope that we'll get that back. So physically, we're looking at physically planting our hedges establishing them, creating. We did a, a species survey of the pond before we built it to make sure that we weren't going to re replace uh, rare species with a, a newly created habitat, planting. We also do ephemeral management, bird boxes with the RSPV for tree sparrow and um, barn owl. So I wonder if I can just, in addition to that quote, just end with a quote recently provided by Dan Brown of the RSPB. He says, perhaps my greatest memory of our work done over the last seven to eight years was the truly amazing numbers of white butterflies flying in your organic spring barley. There was a profusion of fumit trees and other arable plants within the crop. I think there were around 150 butterflies in that small field. I've walked through hectare upon hectare of barley over the years and have never seen anything even close to it. For me, that was really vivid visual example of how organic farming, alongside appropriate management, can create ideal conditions for biodiversity. Thank you. Right, we're, we're, we're now going to find out how this bit works. So all four speakers plus Nick come back up and bring these chairs. And Nick will cross-examine them. Yep. I suggest also, as sitting is the new smoking, you all stand up. All right, OK. Say hello to your neighbour if you don't already know them. Don't leave this, uh, this uh, heat sink, which the... Uh, but just take two seconds, two minutes rather, to stand and stretch before you uh, ready yourself. Hmm? Oh, they, 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 they should sit. Oh, I see. I think we should.
Okay, everybody. Yeah. One, two. Okay, everybody. Now is uh, time to return to the most important session. So everybody, um, time now to sit, please, and to return to this session. So everybody now, please, please quieten down over the excitement of all these presentations. And let me outline how we're going to play this now. So thank you, everybody, for your, um, for your stretch there. I hope you all feel better and you've got to know your neighbors. If, if you didn't already, you weren't already married to them or work with them. Um, so good morning, everybody. My name's Nick, and I'm going to try to tease out from our honored guests uh, some of the themes that seem to be evident within these talks, uh, and also to really uh, thank uh, Emery and, and Deborah for their remarkable uh, delivery, given that they arrived in Edinburgh yesterday from Texas. So I think uh, really quite a, a courageous performance. Um, now, I would like to say that um, uh, during this particular session, we'll have a period where I'll be challenging or indeed asking each of the panel to pick up on a theme that I raise. And then in the last five to seven minutes, which may run over because the next uh, half hour is after 10.30, after 11.30 rather, is a coffee break session. We may run over slightly, but there will be time thereafter. You now know who all these individuals are by sight. And they, are, they won't bite. You can come and talk to them afterwards. These are all uh, generous and uh, hardworking individuals to regenerate our understanding of what it means to have a relationship with food. Now, I'd like to raise that as my first theme in this segue. That was a very neat segue. But before that, I'll just say there will be two roving microphones from my glamorous assistants on the left and right here. So when you have a burning question at the end of this uh, uh, teasing out session, I'd like you to put up your hand, and I'll uh, point, and we'll see if we can get a microphone. Please keep your questions to what is, you know, if they have been already been teased out a little bit already, then let's see if we can raise new topics to address the panel. Then I'll put it to the panel who will then answer. Right, let's get going. Now, there's one theme I'd like to pick up on this morning, and that is time. There's been a, 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 a period of what I would describe as meta-anxiety around environmental issues over the last six to nine months to one year. Well, it seems to me to be extremely belated and uh, somewhat over, um, uh, s s somewhat hysterical to create more misery and anxiety than a climate for uh, action and uh, uh, embedded change. And what I have heard this morning is, and what I have found through my own relationship with food, is the wonderful healing power of nature. And that we ne don't necessarily can sit back and think about time being on our side, but what I'd like to address today with each of the panel is their own experience, because they've talked about a long time. Denise, you talked about you know, 12 years, 17 years. Well, in man's history, that is but a dot, you know, a dot on the end of a dot on the end of a dot. I mean, it's such a small period of time. So what I think is remarkable about each of their stories is how quickly they've been able to uh, increase biodiversity, increase uh, holding capacity, to increase profitability, dare I say it, after some hardship periods, which thankfully we all go through to make us robust. So I'd like to throw open to the panel here, who would like to first speak about time and change being actually rather more rapid than uh, we would like to Im imagine is, is actually part of our central part of our anxiety. Do we have enough time? I'd like to hear some, some, some uh, stories about change through your own actions and tease that out. Who would like to speak first? We were, no. we were astonished how quickly species came back to peel and once we started building structural change. Um, but we shouldn't be lackadaisical about it or, or get a sense of false security. Unless we make the structural changes, we will not get nature responding. So we actually have to put the facility in place to make the changes happen. But it is there. And you know, nature is very generous and very tolerant. But we now have to respond to that. I think 
the, um, the key thing that we did was changing from a monoculture of ryegrass to a diverse sward. That brought the insects back, learning to manage soils, um, rebuilt organic matter brought the soil insects back. And knowing what I've learned on a steep learning curve over the last 15 years, that can actually be achieved quite rapidly. Once that feed source is back, then the birds come back themselves, the diversity comes back itself. And it, it's surprising how rapid that does start to happen. I think my story about time is that it's uh, quicker to lose your soil carbon than it is to gain it, um, and that it takes a long time, but actually there's a really important message there about maintaining what we've actually got, um, and we have experiments that have been going for up to 100 years, and we, we, know, we know we can maintain the soil carbon levels even if we can't build them, and that's important. Deborah. Emery, Deborah. <laughs> thank you, you have been appointed by your husband. Yes, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, I'm echoing Denise. I think that, uh, that the changes that have come about, especially in the nine years since the drought started in 2010 and ended, we've seen remarkable changes at the ranch. So the good news is that if you do something, I believe you're going to see some change. That's our experience, is that you will see change for the benefit if your management decisions are in line with the natural functions of what you manage. Um, what we find is hopeful, and the, the, the studies that are coming out about the current um, health of our soils, they're not dramatically high. You know, Gabe Brown can talk about how high his uh, organic matter is. Ours, in the latest report I have, it says it, it's just not, it's, they're good, they're good, they're not great. I found hope in that. That just told me that if they're good, that means we have a lot more work to do, but we see that you can make a difference in a relatively short period of time. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Now, I, my next question is going to be attitudes of neighbors. The farming fraternity has this um, interesting relationship uh, between reality and uh, experience and neighborly practices. So I'd like to ask them really for some poignant stories about uh, what it means to be leading the way in, in, in our sense of uh, coming uh, to coexist with nature and indeed uh, to, to uh, obtain real benefit from our relationship with nature, to how that feels to the farming neighbors. So I think this is a question I'll start on the right now and then move around to, on, on my right and move around to the left. I'd like to see how it feels to be leading the way amongst your neighbors. We're having a dialogue over here about who gets to answer this one. Um, uh, what we can tell you is that we share fence lines with about three neighbors. One of our neighbors has seen what the differences that are taking place and has adopted a planned grazing. We are very hopeful about that. Uh, but as for the rest of the county, they may be saying they have regenerative beef, they may be branding their beef, but what we can tell you is that they're not doing anything or doing very little to heal the soils. So we, our, our experience, and, and as I shared with you, Emory stayed hidden for almost 30 years in this. It is not still, we are hopeful. The more conferences I go to, the younger people are beginning to take this on, and even some other folks our age coming into this industry are ready to do some things that are different. But we will tell you that we have not had an experience where people are knocking down on the doors. Okay. Okay, can I pass over to you? I think the best story we have is when I said I was going to take Mana Farm Organic. I've never seen news spread on the grapevine so quick. <laughs> um, but now they've seen the grazing in action, seen what we're doing with the herbal lays. Our neighbour now has taken on the running of an arable farm next door, and all our bull calves are going on to herbal lays on that to regenerate soils on there. So slowly but surely, they're watching what's happening, seeing the productivity we're getting, seeing the health of the stock, and it is slowly starting to spread. Thank you. Chris and I are blow-ins. They've been farming at Peatland for nearly 30 years. I think our neighbours still think of us as hairy-toed hippies. No, you're, you're hairy toes, not mine. <laughs> um, we farm in the context of 60,000 hectares of Berwickshire 
are farmed by 10 contract farmers, very, very intensively farmed. So that's our farming context. We have 15 neighbors, um, all conventional farmers. Um, but the interesting thing is that certainly our closest neighbor who actually helps us with some of our tillage is certainly quite interested to see um, our, how many silage cuts we can get. And when we were growing arable, that actually we didn't suffer any drastic decline in productivity. So definitely people are looking at us. But bear in mind that those neighbors this week would have read in the Farmers Weekly that 2019 Beef Farmer of the Year, who is farming 6,000 beef, fattening 6,000 beef in 50 hectares, that is the British beef farmer's hero, if you like, the anti-hero to what we're seeing. So that is our broader neighbor. That's the context in which we farm, but definitely we are being watched. Thank you, Jane. Keep the microphone. I'm going to keep you on the hot spot. In fact, both yourself and Rob are going to take the, my, my, my last point as finishing farmers um, in the sense that I would like to talk about taste. Extraordinary, but we're going to talk about taste. I'd like to have some stories about how your customers, your consumers, your, your, your relationship with the consumer has changed or indeed has grown through your producing what I would describe as nutrient-dense or uh, foods. And I'd like now to talk about flavor and their reaction and their reaction to the experience of eating your foods. Well, we're constantly surprised why people find our meat so good. Because we're not doing anything special to it. We're just farming it and butchering it and presenting it to the customer. But they all love it. So what that's telling us is what the hell are the supermarkets doing to meat and food? So we're not doing anything very special. But also, just a point, our customers have led the way for us. We've done farmers markets for over 15 years. What farmers customers tell us over the phone and online and at markets has definitely directed our, the way we go. So but taste words, is very important. Yeah, I mean, is that, would that be translated into loyalty and therefore revenue and therefore a relationship? Absolutely. Right? Which is? The, the relationship is extremely important, right. but the, the linchpin definitely is quality and taste. Quality if we didn't have quality or taste, they wouldn't keep buying from us. Uh, and Rob, do you have a story to add to that? And then we'll, 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 we'll go out to the, to the audience. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a recent development for us, but our uh, local pub has just been taken over and the chef was very keen to put veal on the menu. So we had some calves which have been out at pasture from two weeks old, were coming up to eight months and um, put some into there. The response to that has been tremendous to the pub. He's already tried veal from other sources and can't get the tenderness or the flavor that we are getting. I have heard that some supermarket contracts do not want any forage or grazing into veal calves. They just want them on grain and straw. These are out at grass, um, as I say, right from birth, reared on that, a little bit of cake. And um, it seems to be touching the spot. Um, so I, I don't see the issue with grazing calves. No. Thank you. So now it's up to you. Let's take um, a, uh, we'll, we'll do 10 minutes, I think, of questioning, and then it'll be coffee break. So uh, my glamorous assistant was the, the first here in the center. You, sir. Thank you. Um, ben Hunt, representing the ethical omnivore movement. My question is about regenerative agriculture and whether the um, speakers think that we have a PR problem within regenerative agriculture. As Christine said, the, um, you said the science isn't in. And a couple of years ago, we had the FCRN report, uh, Grazed and Confused, which was a big meta study that said basically, we can't tell that it works. And yet, there's anecdotal evidence from all over the world in different climates saying it works. And we can build soil and we can build carbon. So um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on what we need to do to get policy to start to realize that this is a real thing. I think that that uh, particular person left already the, um, the, uh, our, our event today to hear this particular point, which is absolutely on the button. 
which is this lag between the reality of what we're tasting in the food and seeing outside. I mean, I'm, I'm not a speaker. I should shut up now. But you, you've actually put, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. If, if we were talking about how uh, little support there is, or indeed little understanding there is, for this particular movement. So who would like to pick up what I think I thought it might be? <laughs> Just, you, can, you have free reign. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, the key to this is science needs to catch up with what's going on in reality. I was on a European focus group looking at grazing for carbon last year, the year before. We're on a research place in France, and the particular research had 200,000 quid's worth of technology, could measure everything going into and out of this pasture, and she had two pastures, one set stocked at half a livestock unit a hectare, the other set stocked at one livestock unit a hectare, no leaf area on this pasture whatsoever, and this is what's been measured as to the ability of carbon sequestration. So we need to get some actual true measures on properly managed and grazed um, pastures, and there's a huge lag there between the reality of what's doing really well and the reality as to what science is measuring. I think I have to comment, don't I? Um, I mean, I, I think what, what we're looking at doing more and more is participatory research and the need to actually involve farmers in research because, you know, we're all aware that it's not only scientists that can have ideas, that's clear. We want, we want input from farmers, but from the very start of the research. And I think one of the things that we have done in, for, for, a, for a long period of time is that... Uh, we've, we've brought farmers into the process too late, and we need to, we need to look at uh, involving farmers from the very start of the research, and we, we are gradually starting to do that, but it's, it requires different funding models, and, and it requires a willingness and an openness from scientists and from farmers, and, you know, we're up for it. Yes, I mean, I think the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a dual cycle going on here if we consider that we are separate from nature, which is really why we're here today, because we've considered this for far too long. But if we consider that we are of nature, then the yearning in us from our own health and our own wellness is mirrored in what we're seeing in our soils and in our agricultural practices. And therefore, this joining up is, is inevitable because we're seeing the decline in our own, you know, mankind's health. And this is coming from what is, in effect, what we feed ourselves. Um, would you like to say a few words, Deborah? I, I just, uh, I recently attended a grass-fed exchange conference in California, and one of the breakout sessions was fielded by a group of four or five scientists, uh, researchers, not anecdotal evidence, but they are launching a new magazine called Regenerative Magazine. The articles will be peer-reviewed. Um, they are looking at putting the hard data behind this anecdotal information that we all share. So I'm, I'm very, I'm excited about that coming on board. In the States, what we have found is that the research has taken place in small, limited plots, not at scale, not with the practices that regenerative or uh, ag farmers and ranchers are really doing, and that's biased, the reporting. And, um, but uh, one of our favorite gurus is Dr. Richard Teague. Again, we see that that science is coming into the environment, but it's just slow. It's just, it's been slow. But look, look for that new magazine, Regenerative Ag Magazine. And the next question, please. So, okay, one, one here. We're not tremendously good at joining up communities of separate people. So the company that I work for, we have recently, over the past eight years, been doing a science of artisan cheese every two years that we do, which brings in scientists, farmers, and cheesemakers. But it's getting those sorts of things started so that the academic community, the farming communities, all of those people can come together. So I think that's something that we need to work on as a community like you guys are working on here. Yes, I think that's a very good point because if we look at the uh, periodicals available to us all or to you all from a farming perspective, they are skewed towards you know, big ag and what we would call as conventional agriculture, whatever that means, or conventional farming. Um, and so I think that there is a, there is a, a black hole 
of, uh, of, of in, in, this, in, in, in the sense there isn't a voice, as there is in America with Acres, and, and the, there are 18 different uh, established enterprises or organizations that are uh, in, in, engaged in what we would call holistic and regenerative and uh, 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 nature conscious farming. And uh, we have that much fewer here. So in many ways, America is way ahead, as also we might describe as also way behind. Um, any comments on that question in terms of lack of, I mean, there is an isolation sense, and that was the point I, I, I made about asking each of the farmers here what it feels like to be more or less on your own, and I feel that very strongly when I talk to David and Wilma. You know, it's a lonely place, and uh, it's, it's crucially important that we talk and engage and share, so we have this what my wife hates me to describe as quorum sensing, where we actually sense each other. I think it's called community by any other sort of, um, I get lots of buzzword bingos on quorum sensing, which of course is what's going on in the soil between the mycorrhizae and the bacteria. And we need to do that between ourselves. Any, 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 any comments here? I think the one attempt to do that is the innovative farmers um, set up through the Soil Association, trying to link science and agriculture, and I think that is something that needs to be built on and expanded in some way. Yeah. And we don't, also, the um, online community is very strong. But don't forget, where we are here now is very much part of a very positive movement. And this is the beginning of the, uh, the answer to your question um, about community. This is a community. And we just need to keep the momentum going. So, and also, if you all shook hands at the end of this, imagine the bacterial exchange. <laughs> See? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think I would absolutely support the idea that we need to, we need to develop our ability to do systems-based research uh, rather than uh, reductionist research. And people are, of course, an absolutely key component. People in decision-making are a very key component in the success of that. Well done. Okay, we take one more question. It's coming up to 22 now, and then we'll close. So who's got a burning new question that's going to set us on fire? Or at least, uh, right, uh, let's go. Who's, who's waving hardest? Who's got the most hybrid vigor? <laughs> okay, right at the back there. I'm sorry, we're going to go right to the back. Hi, yeah. Uh, so um, just feeding on from the idea we do need to collaborate with different groups. So I'm a vet and I'm interested in how vets can feed into regenerative farming. So I'm interested with your experience. Um, how useful have you found your vets with your endeavors? And could you see them as being useful partners moving forwards as far as sustainable farming practices? Very good. Uh, Deborah, would you like to answer that? You've got a... Deborah, you got, we'll you, yeah. would you like to pass on that in terms of the um, farmer vet relationship and its um, interesting life cycle? Um, we've had uh, an interesting run with, with the vet because we went down the antibiotic free route. Um, luckily, it was us and another dairy producer with the same vet practice, so that kind of focused the minds that they were going to have to get their heads around it and work with us. And actually, since We've done that, and they've seen the results. Um, they have come on board, but that's taken a whole shift in perspective, and it's, it's been quite an interesting journey. But we, what we, we actually have developed as part of our Soil Association um, criteria is, is an animal health plan with our vets, so we actually share our animal health plan with our vets. So really, though they cost, our vets are very important to the development and ongoing management of our, of our livestock. Okay, thank you. Um, what I'm going to do now is, oh, actually what I was going to say with regard to uh, veterinary practice, um, I am here with Will Winter, who's speaking later, and he's a holistic vet, and uh, he's the other gentleman with the uh, 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 bulletproof hat that you'll see. <laughs> Uh, wondering around, so do introduce yourself to Will Winter to talk about uh, his, his um, journey from being a, uh, a veterinary practitioner to being a holistic veterinary practitioner. Now I'm going to put each of our panelists on the spot now and ask them for one or two words to close off, um, which I am sure I'm not going to inspire them to be uh, speaking hopefully, but I would like to have their 
their um, single point for you to take away from what they've brought today so that you can remember them by. So we'll start on my right here with Deborah. Okay, so he said, hurry up, his leg is hurting. So um, I've got three points to make. Number one, all of the improvements that we talked about were done because there were livestock on, on the land, right? Livestock are critical to the success of making changes in soil health. Number two, you're never too old. You're never, never too old. And number three, we say keep a big tent. Not all of us are organic yet or may never be, but not, not all of us are, have made the changes. On, some of us call ourselves organic, but we haven't made the changes on the soil. We need to stay together as a community. We're bringing that back into it. We need to keep the big tent. We need to support one another and not be divisive under, under what we have here. So we need to stand up, stay together. Well, I guess for me, managing soil organic matter is, is not only crucial to productivity and food security, but also to the environmental impact of agriculture. Build your soil organic matter, you won't go too far wrong. I think the key message is to realise you can run a productive farm and tick all the boxes from environmental, sustainable, holistic um, management. And great tasting food. Yeah. Okay, so be optimistic, be realistic, and eat well. Well done.